Good afternoon, and uh, we're very pleased to have our first global speaker this semester, I realize. Um, our speaker's name is uh, Dr. Archon, Professor Dr. Archon Misra. He's now at the School of Information Systems at Singapore Management University, which I understand is a relatively new university in Singapore. But Archon has worked at uh, IBM and um, uh, I guess uh, Telco? Belco. Belco. Yeah. It was called Belco, but it's then Telco for, for many years, IBM research. And um, he's currently an associate professor uh, in Singapore. His research interest is in the area of uh, pervasive computing, mobile system, with specific focus on energy efficient stream analytics, data mining, for example. Um, and and, you know, lots of research area in that uh, area. Over the past 12 years, he um, has worked in extensively in the area of wireless networks, basic computing mobile data management. And he's a co-author of um, papers that received the best paper awards in several conferences, including EUC 2008, uh, ECMIT Walmart 2002, and I took the mail in 2001. Speaking of Walmart, actually, I had the pleasure of working with Archon many years ago. I think it was 2006. He was the uh, TPC chair. And that conference was held right here in uh, Niagara Falls, uh, New York. Um, he's also an editor of the IEEE transaction on mobile computing and uh, L. Sevier's Journal of Pervasive and Mobile Computing. He chaired the uh, IEEE Computer Society's <coughs> Technical Committee on Computer Communication from 2005 to 2007. He received his PhD in ECE department from University of Maryland at College Park. He knows our president, uh, Satish Chupati. Uh, he was there. And uh, he, received, he graduated from uh, IIT, Karakpur, India. In, uh, Electronics and communication in the So, welcome, Ajahn. Thank you, Chunmin. That is the longest introduction I've ever had. Thank you. You can talk more. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no, so thank you. I didn't even realize I had told you all those things. So, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Speaking of, you know, you said about your president. I remember he was, you know, obviously a full professor. I was the youngest student at his first sort of Indian festival, Diwali party, at his home. And I looked at that and I said, boy, is it good to be a professor. That's what I should become. So it's, you know, it's, it's really an amazing coincidence to see that back in Buffalo and, you know, he's obviously pressing after so many years. So uh, once again, thank you all very much for coming. I, it's, I see it's a full house. I know for some of you, for the grad students, it's, a, it's mandatory attendance. <laughs> so I, I can sense your lack of enthusiasm. I mean, just your feeling. But I promise, you know, I'll let you out here by when. Should make, when should I? By 4.30. So I have about 50 slides. If I went through them, you'd be here till 9.30. Okay. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I will touch on some of the highlights. I've tried to skip most of the math in the top, not because you guys don't understand math. It's just that it's less boring. And if you have more details, you know, you're always welcome to you know, contact me afterwards and talk to me about it. So the one thing that you didn't mention in the introduction, so actually recently I've had introductions where people say, Oh, I was trained as a computer scientist and now I'm working in transportation engineering and so on. So I am the example of reverse. I am the untrained computer scientist. I had no training in computer science. I did you know, communication engineering. Of course, I did all the courses. But now what I do is basically all computer science. And coming to you know, a department school that's in computer science, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk to you. The, the talk is divided into sort of three parts, or actually four parts. So, about 15 minutes of the talk is going to be a non-technical description of this project called Live Labs. Um, so with, along with uh, my colleague, Assistant Professor Rajesh Balan, the two of us direct this project. It's a very large mobile sensing and lifestyle experimentation project. Um, I'll give you a high-level overview of it. You know, there's a phone lab project out here that's started. Some of you will see the synergies. I'll also point out what I perceive to be the differences between the projects. Uh, so I'll spend about 15-20 minutes on that, motivating why we chose to do this project, you know, who our end customers are. And part of the message that I wanted to give out to you is, 
Uh, you know, over the course of the last 12 years, I've found that, you know, I do a lot of computer science, but in many cases I find that a lot of faculty and, you know, professors and students, you tend to get constrained in your thinking by thinking that computer science must only apply to computer science companies. So it can only help Microsoft or Google or so on. And I think what I hopefully will illustrate to you, there's a world of possibility out there where the value of computer science and some of the sort of technologies we're developing translates to companies that you don't think of every day. You know, it's the Starbucks, the Visa, the Procter & Gamble. They all tend to derive value from some of the underlying technologies that we create. And I just wanted to make you aware of that. And then I'll talk about three problems uh, in greater detail. So, for, what is Live Labs? You know, it's the way we wanted to think of it, it's providing you a participant base. We are handing out not phones, but software on people's phones. There are going to be about 30,000 opt in consumers in three public spaces in, SM, uh, in Singapore. One is our SMU campus, it's about seven to 8,000 students. <coughs> two, at least two big malls. I don't call them shopping malls because in places in Asia, especially in Singapore, they're not just there for shopping. You catch the train over there, you get a haircut over there, you go on a date over there, you get divorced over there. You, you pretty much do everything inside these malls because it's hot and humid out, out, outside. So it's what we call lifestyle malls. You know, you go for eating, to catch your movies over there. They're about a million square feet. They get about 60 to 70,000 visitors a day. So incredibly dense, incredibly, uh, you know, packed urban spaces. And Sentosa, for those of you who don't know it, think of it as like the Disneyland of Singapore. It's sort of an island with a lot of outdoor attractions, some indoor attractions. It's a combination of the two. It gets a lot of tourists. The key distinction between the malls and Sentosa, and I'll allude to it a little bit, but not too much, is that Sentosa gets about 80% of its visitors are foreign tourists. And why that's important is because these people, even though they have phones, they don't have data plans because it's very expensive to roam. So we have to figure out ways to interact with these people through other technologies, such as Wi-Fi, etc., and that throws up some interesting challenges. So at its heart, it's like a two-legged stool. So it's a combination of two things. For the networking people in this room, tend to think of it as an advanced wireless broadband network. So we are going to have our own LTE network in our campus with our own dedicated band. So all our participants will get really high bandwidth, access bandwidth, and so on. So that provides this localized high bandwidth for applications. So we get really incredibly high density of users. Whenever there's free pizza in the, you know, during lunch, all our students, all our faculty show up. So we get about densities of one person per square feet. So if you think that's not dense, you know, this room is what, about 250 square feet or 300? Imagine the 300 students, people over here. Mm -hmm. So that creates what's localized hotspots of very high demand. People are playing games, downloading videos, YouTube videos, and so on. So how do we do that? Uh, part of the other challenge, we have a major telco as a partner, is how do we collect real-time context? So your phone, as you all know, I don't need to preach to you, is you know, a very sensor-rich device. It can sense a lot of things about you. There have been applications that I won't get into now, but that also talk about, you know, there have been applications of adoptment and so on that sense how your emotional well-being is based on the manner in which you're talking with people. Are you being aggressive? Are you being passive? So it's, it's getting really fascinating out there. It's not just you know, the ability to sense whether you're walking or sitting, but it's a sort of holistic picture of your everyday lifestyle. So we want to do things such as fine grain in your location, monitoring of events, such as which application you're using, etc. And we want to do this continuously. So energy is our big challenge. So that's the technology part. But even if you abstract out the technology part, the bigger value over here is this so-called easy structured experimentation service. And I'll explain it to you later. What it does is it lets lifestyle companies, companies that don't care about mobile technology, don't understand Android, don't understand programming, it just wants to test how people behave under different contexts. It allows them to do, we automate participant selection, we automate the delivery of content, so we allow you to run controlled behavioral experiments. This is what psychologists want to do, this is what you know, marketers want to do. They want to understand how people behave when you give them different incentives in different you know, contexts and we automate the deployment of apps and so on. So when I talked about the testbed in three places, so there is a testbed on our campus, this is where the LTE network goes, uh, you know, the advanced network. There are some femto cells that are being put in place, a directional antenna system put in place to provide high bandwidth in this sort of quasi-indoor environment. And here the focus, the sector we're focusing is sort of telecom and digital media. This is where you want to test out the next video distribution service, the next 
uh, multimedia chat service. So how do you need bandwidth for this? How do you download mobile games? So there are a lot of sort of 3D mobile games and high definition mobile games coming out. What bandwidth do they need? How do we offer low latency? How do we do data offloading between femto and local networks to you know, broadband, 3G networks, etc. Um, so there are a bunch of partners, you know, Microsoft Research and Qualcomm. Uh, uh, they play in that space. Then there's the tourism and hospitality sector. That's like the Sentosa place. Um, the focus there is on trying to get people's context to improve their behavior in these uh, theme park environments. So we do a lot of crowd coordination. We figure out where queues are building up. How do we give you better itineraries? Dynamically plan that, okay, it's going to rain in about five minutes. Can I redirect you to an F&B outlet? You're there with your child. They're maybe getting a little bit tired. So I give you a different attraction and suggest a different itinerary. So, and the last one is perhaps some, in some sense the most exciting. This is where the most monetary value is attached. This is the live labs at the malls. The focus here on retail and com consumption lifestyle. So it's about the ability to get real-time insight into what shoppers and visitors are doing in malls. What stores are you visiting? What are you doing inside the store? Who you're with? How long did you sit down for coffee? Did you take the stairs up? Which stores did you visit, etc.? And this can be used for a whole variety of applications. So our partners are Capital Malls Asia, which is actually a behemoth. It's the largest mall operator in Asia. You know, they own a ton of malls. Uh, DBS is a major bank. We have Visa worldwide as one of the partners. So if I set that up, let me give you one. Now, this is not a representative example, but at least it illustrates at a high level. Don't understand technology. What can you do with live apps? Think you're a lifestyle company, and your lifestyle company could be your movie theater. We have a cloud service. And we tell that, the movie theater tells the service that I want to try out this experiment. So I say if a group of four or more people, they exit, for, this is the cafe, the movie theater is on the opposite side. If four or more people sit down in the cafe, they have a meal together for about 10 minutes or more than 10 minutes, then when they leave the cafe, I want to give them an SMS with a discount for the movie. Because you think, okay, they've had a cup of coffee, they might be more interested in watching the movie. That's what this third party company wants to do. It goes to a website and says, this is the experiment I want to run. These are the control group or the test group. These are the triggers. This is the stimulus that must be met. This is the intervention I want you to do. That's all they tell us. Now, what I'm illustrating over here, you know, one person comes in, sits down, you know, pardon the animation. So five minutes later, three of his or her buddies show up. They all sit down. Now, all of this live lab software that's running on the phone, is continuously monitoring these people. It's figuring out that you walked into the cafe, you sat down, you sat down together. It's reporting all of that to a back-end service. And that service is intelligently figuring out, oh, there are four or more people who are sitting down in the cafe. So that conditions we met. So 10 minutes later, you know, part of the over-animated slide, they walk out. As soon as they walk out, back at the back end, now they realize, oh, you know, these people have actually left the cafe after 10 minutes. So I've measured their real-time context. I've realized that they've satisfied this condition. Once that happens, the cloud service will use SMS, could use you know, mobile advertising, could use HTML5, whatever. There are various ways to you know, touch base with the consumer. It shows this notification on get 20% on movies. So suddenly, you get this pop-up on your phone that says, oh, there's 20% of movies at the theater if you come in the next 30 minutes. This is just illustrating the whole life cycle of live labs the ability to, for you to do real-time in-situ experimentation using the context of one or more users. That's fundamentally what makes it so attractive to people because now you can do real experiments with mobile services and mobile applications. Okay? So in terms of the ecosystem, as I said, it's a large-scale research testbed. So I think what is important to point out is what makes it attractive is it's large-scale. Now, you know, there are 5 million people in Singapore. We're not putting the software in 5 million people. We just don't have the money, the capacity to do that. We're going after 30,000 users. So it's large enough that the people who run consumer experiments will say we're getting statistically significant and valid reading. So they can do control groups, market segmentation, demographic segmentation, etc. Yet it's small enough that we can hopefully manage it. Because when you get into the practicalities of building these systems, they're a nightmare. Why? Because people have different devices, different OS versions different firmware releases. So, you know, when you start building the real system, it becomes a scalability nightmare to manage. So we have to try to manage it at some point because we can't grow too big. So it's a flagship project. You know, this project is funded at a $10 million level. I illustrated some of our partners. So the technology partners are, you know, the suspects like Microsoft, 
and uh, StarHub, which is the telco over there, they're the number two telco. So they're kind of like a Verizon or AT&T of, of the U.S. There are the venue owners, the Capital Mall, the Sentosa, the Changi Airport. So the Changi Airport, which is, you know, many of you know, one of the you know, busiest hub airports. It's also, I found out, it's, it's, you don't tend to think of an airport that way. The Changi Airport is also on the dollar value, the largest mall in Singapore. Because you, people do a tremendous amount of duty-free shopping. So a lot of their revenue is actually derived not from planes landing and taking off, but by people shopping at the airport. So, and then you have all these people doing services, DBS, Visa, Inmobi, which is a mobile advertising company. Uh, so, to set this thing up and put this in perspective, how would we build it? And this is lays the groundwork for the technical portion of my talk. So, I wanted to illustrate that Lion Labs itself has four real technology pillars. So, the first pillar is what goes on the phone. We have to put software on the phone that does this mobile sensing and the localized analytics. So, you can use your accelerometer to detect your activities such as sitting, standing, etc. It can use, you know, tapping into your Android notifications to figure out what you're browsing, you know, what URL you're visiting. It can use Wi-Fi scanning. It can use inertial navigation to figure out your indoor location. So it gets all this information. So hold on to this for a second. In the example I said, there's the lifestyle company. It could be the Starbucks or, you know, the movie theater company that says to the intervention engine, it pushes, okay, tell, deliver this movie discount when four people leave the coffee shop. So this piece, in turn, tells our real-time analytics engine that I want to be notified when four people leave the coffee shop after 10 minutes, okay? So in the meantime, the software which is collecting sends the data up to uh, data, data storage, a server that takes the data and stores it. But storing the raw data is only the easy part. You know, you have to decide the schemas, etc. That's not so hard. But what you have to do after that comes this part. Where again, this is not how the query is going to look like. I wanted to simplify it because most people find it easy to understand SQL as opposed to if I put an R script out there, for example. So the reason I wanted to illustrate, whoops. So I want, I'm telling this engine that I want to select the user location coffee shop and the activity has been sitting for more than 10 minutes. So you have to do this at scale. So scalability of the analytics engine is a real challenge because it's 30,000 users in real time Different people, you have different experiments going on. Some people sitting in the coffee shop, some walking by a store, somebody else playing a certain video game with some of their selected friends. So all of this we want to detect in real time. So this is where the analytics comes in. But once that is done, you notify that the intervention engine. So the analytics engine notifies the intervention engine that I met this trigger. This was like a query subscription. And then you deliver. So this delivery mechanism again goes through the same software. You know, you have a server site, there's a control channel, delivers this thing. Could be a pop-up notification, could be an SMS, could be an email sent to your email account. All of these are possible. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to spend a little time now. This is more administrative, but I wanted to illustrate the Light Lab project. As I said, it's about ten minutes. It's actually affiliated with an independent project called LARC, Living Analytics Research Center, which is something we are jointly doing with Carnegie Mellon at the university level between CS and business schools. So that, the focus there is on large scale societal analytics. So the only thing I wanted to mention is the data that we collect from Light Labs is a micro, is a very deeply instrumented medium scale test bed. That data feeds into other sources of data. So we have projects that are mining Twitter data, that are mining Facebook data, for example, that are mining um, you know, transit records of people as they use the MRTs or the subways and the, you know, they pay tolls at different places. So that's like societal scale big data. So I wanted to distinguish between the big data piece and what we call the deep data piece. This is very fine-grained data, but not from the millions of users. This is, you know, sort of online interaction data or visit data, but from millions of users, not necessarily in real time, because collecting this data in real time is a challenge. So on, the, on top of that comes all the analytic services that Lark is working on. These could be things like doing business analytics. This could be things like figuring out, you know, where you want to do better optimization of pricing strategies. Maybe for MRT rights, you suggest that, okay, give a 15% discount in certain times of the day and so on. So there's a whole bunch of other faculty who are working on that space. So what LARC helps Live Lab by providing us analytic support in some of the key areas. So some of the group analytics algorithms I'll talk about technically sit in the LARC project with which I'm affiliated as well. And then they build a lot of apps and they deliver this. Now we said there are third-party apps. So some apps are from Live Labs, 
Some are from LARP, but okay, this is still the university ecosystem. But the vast majority of apps come from external companies. They come from game developers, they come from you know, Procter & Gamble, they come from Starbucks. And some of them need not even be apps. They could just be these experiments that they tell us to test this out. Okay? So, let's get to the technology piece of the talk now. So, what are some of the key R&D challenges? And I will only talk about a few of them today. So, one, we have to do this deep, continuous context collection. Forget about the year one, two, and three. That's, you know, it's a slide we used for internal scheduling, you know, when you report to the government. But fundamentally, what do we do? We have to collect continuously the context from people and transmit it. So, energy is a bottleneck. Privacy is a bottleneck. I will not talk about privacy today. It's a challenge. I broke up one of these contexts as indoor localization. So we have to get indoor location because most of our environments are indoors. We need to track people because location is still the most important context. That's why I separated it out. There's been a lot of work in indoor location and we are very respectful of that work, but you know, I'll make this broad claim on, on camera that very little of it actually works in real environments. And I'll illustrate to you, we haven't cracked this problem, but we've at least encountered some of the challenges why some of these techniques don't work. Then the challenge is derive the analytics. This is the group analytics piece I was talking about. <coughs> I'll allude to that. Then the ability to run these automated social experiments. We have to find the right interventions. We have to allow third-party verification of these applications, etc. This I will not talk about today. I will very briefly talk about the ability to handle network transient traffic loads because both of these, frankly, we haven't done much. It's very much early work. I don't have anything significant to report. Okay. So let me pause here for a second. Anybody has any questions about the fundamentals of live labs? Anything you want to ask me just to clarify? Please feel free to do so. Yes? We might get to this uh, in a bit, but uh, you sort of alluded to the fact that you were using R as a query language. Um, it's one of the possibilities we are exploring because some of the queries are specified not, you know, give this discount to person X, but you specify this more as give, you know, if the person is talking to the three most popular people that he communicates with, then trigger something out. So there is some sort of statistical correlation-based predicates. So for that, you know, we're exploring the use of R. Okay. Is, is are that there any other languages? Are there other languages? Yeah. Or any other representations? Of um, there are many others, of course. We just haven't got to that point okay. yet. So that, that, that's, that, that would be my fair comment. Because that comes with the experimentation framework, which we've done very little of work on right now. So, so once I broke out, as I said, it stands on four pillars. So today, I will basically talk about these two, because we have some work to report over here. I will leave it a little bit to it, because we've just started working on this. And this one, frankly, we haven't done much work at all. So I will leave that out for today's. So let's start with the deep context collection problem. So the problem here is the energy overhead. So we want to collect all this context data. And what I illustrated over here, so this is like no live labs. This is the power consumed on a Galaxy S3. It's about 250 milliwatts, you know, just running regularly. If we run the ability to collect all the things such as your, your context, such as which application are you using, you know, what URL are you visiting, then you end up almost collecting no additional power consumption. If you run activity recognition, which is the ability to use the accelerometer, et cetera, to figure out are you sitting or walking, you begin to see that you get about a 30 to 40 percent rise in energy consumption. Now, once you begin to accumulate, you begin to take GPS and the nanometer and so on, and you see that the energy begins to shoot up. Now, it's a somewhat surprising result because, you know, traditionally we've all been told GPS is the most expensive sensor. You know, it takes about 350 milliwatts, nothing else consumes. But it turns out that, yes, the sensors may not, but just because the CPU is on, because it consumes energy, so the energy overheads already get pretty high for even some of the other sensors. So even for the compass, you see the energy consumption is not very negligible. This is the assumption you make only if you test the compass sensor, it's not very high. But when you begin to do, you know, run the queries on it, etc., and it's on all the time, it gets pretty high. So fundamentally the challenge is if you think we went from 200 to about 450, what it does, at a very crude level, you're having the operational lifetime of the device. So if the person was charging at 8 a.m. in the morning and was next charging it at 11 at night, now you're saying it's going to run out of battery, let's say, at you know, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And that's just fundamentally unacceptable. Nobody's going to sign up for our service 
if we tell them that you have to recharge in the middle of the day? They'll say, okay, thank you, right? Uh, so we have to do something to figure this out. So there's about a 20 to 30 percent increase in all cases. So the point is a lot of the activity recognition literature, which many of you have done, I worked on, it's okay for intermittent sensing. So if you want to figure out suddenly, okay, where is this person? You know, what are they doing? Then it's okay. We still need open, it's an open research to address this problem continuously sensing in the background. So it's running all the time. It has to be sort of subliminal. It has to have no energy impact at all. So keep trying to keep this simple, especially to address the first year grad students. So I want to reduce the energy of an activity recognition. I'll use only an exemplar of using the accelerometer to detect whether you're sitting, standing, or posture, you know, these things. So typically, the, what are the steps in making the sense on the phone? So first you have to do the sensing. From the sensing, you have to compute the coefficients. You know, you have to extract features. You, whether you extract Fourier coefficients, you extract the entropy, etc. After you use the features, then you do classification. So you have to run it through some kind of classifier. Could be Bayesian, could be, you know, many different classifiers. You can use a neural network, doesn't matter. But it will output, you know, you give it label data, you train it, and it outputs something. I want to separate out the classification of low-lying activity from something I call content, which is the higher level activity. So, you know, both queuing and exercising might involve a few steps of walking, but they're fundamentally logically different activities. So I wanted to separate them out at this level. That's context. Then comes the high-level query. So if I wanted to figure out that is Archon, you know, sort of forlorn and standing by himself in a queue, or, you know, is he with a bunch of friends and he's really happy, that involves not just the context from one phone, but it involves the context from multiple phones. And that's why I wanted to illustrate. It's a point of departure. You typically, in many cases of practical interest, you're not just interested in one phone's context. You're actually interested in the collective context for multiple people. So once I break that down over here, what I'm going to talk about in 15 minutes or less is three different pieces of work, again, at a very high level. So the first piece, which I call A3R, it's going to focus only on adapting the sensing and feature extraction part. It's just trying to make some optimizations over there. The second part, which I will describe, this I will skip over because it's subsumed in the next one. This focuses on one phone and tries to optimize the high-level query to context detection piece. Okay, I just wanted to explain these. And the last one, which is an ongoing piece of work in cloud query optimization, it's trying to do the optimization across multiple phones. And this is frankly the most interesting and exciting part because this is where you will be able to realize the most amount of savings. Okay, so let's get into A3R. Um, I actually never remember the terminology. I, I give it different names each time I talk. But okay, so it's some accelerometer based activity recognition. So the key idea, the main idea of this work is very simple. Again, I'm just using this as an illustration of many other approaches in this field we've been working on is can I adjust, remember, the sensing and the feature extraction. I said these are the only two pieces I'm looking at. Can I adjust these based on the current activity of the individual? So what does that mean? So there are two parameters for the sensing and feature extraction. One is how frequently you sample. So that's the sampling frequency of the sensor. And then what features do you use to classify? So these are the two things I'm going to play around with. And the goal is to reduce the energy overhead without sacrificing accuracy. Because obviously, there's always a trade-off you can make there. So again, I want to tell you that the work is very empirically motivated. So we do a lot of experiments. You know, we find out how commercial devices behave. So what this graph is illustrating, x-axis is sampling frequency. What happens if we sample at you know, 5 hertz, 16, 15 hertz, 50 hertz, or 100 hertz? And the, the y-axis, the two lines here, are the energy consumed. In one case, when I use only time domain features, so I use like zero crossing and you know the amplitude, etc. The other case, I use frequency domain features, so I you know use the Fourier coefficients, I use you know the entropy, etc. So the two things you see is that obviously, as you increase the sampling frequency, the energy consumption goes up. Not surprising, right? You're sampling more, you're using the sensor more. The other thing is, if you use time plus frequency domain, you use more than you use time domain. Not again. The interesting points are, look at these two points, for example, that using time domain at 100 hertz is actually less expensive than using time plus frequency domain at 16 hertz. And then as you go on in the frequency domain, the scale is non-linearly goes up because 
you have, you know, it's like n log n, if I remember correctly, the Fourier transformation process. So there's sort of a nonlinear slope as you have more sample points to compute on. So the point is, it's not immediately clear that, oh, I'm sampling at a higher frequency, therefore I must take more energy. It all depends on what features you use at what rate. So after that, we do, okay. Uh, what I wanted to show you here, actually I will skip in the interest of time. So it said, okay, what is the different combination of features and uh, sampling frequency? So what this graph illustrates is for different activities, going downstairs, taking an escalator down, walking, sitting or standing, I sample at different frequencies. And I see what is the accuracy I get. So clearly, the, the lower I sample, typically the accuracy drops off. But the thing you see over here is that some activities, the drop off is much sharper. Like going up the escalator, if you sample at like 5 hertz, you're going to lose a lot of accuracy. Some activities such as sitting and standing, there really isn't that much of a difference at what frequency you're sampling. Because, you know, these are pretty sedentary activities, you can sampling at a lower frequency. Right? So, once I have this activity, again, very complex figure, don't pay attention to it. Let me tell you what my algorithm does. It starts at this level. It says, highest frequency using time plus frequency domain. This is the most energy intensive. Suddenly, it figures out, okay, you're matching the activity of sitting. So at that point it says, I'm going to drop down to 5 hertz and use time domain features. So as long as you continue sitting, I'm going to be using the lower frequency and the lower set of features. At some point you will stop sitting, I don't know when, you will go into some other activity. The moment my confidence in sitting drops below a threshold, I go back to my highest activity level and try to classify what you're doing next. When I find out what you're doing next, I will go into that level of activity at that frequency feature. Very simple. Again, I don't need to illustrate the whole process. You're <coughs> taking advantage of the fact that different activities, you, you don't need all of the features and you don't need the sampling at the highest frequency. Why would this help? So we did this study with, you know, again, forget all the details, but the point to illustrate, collecting the data you, it is, is really an effort in itself. So we had six people. This was done in collaboration with the EPFL. These are people in Switzerland. We had them carry this phone around for two to four to six weeks. They collected the data. And what I'm illustrating here, first let's illustrate this point. So this is what they did on a daily basis. Not surprisingly, you find that most users spend a lot of time just sitting in the day. They spend a fair bit of time sitting. They spend a modest amount of time walking faster. And then we had this thing called slow walk. So you kind of amble along. And some people stand and then they take very little stairs. So the whole point is that whatever percentage of the day, 60% of the day you're sitting. Not surprising, right? That's why we're all going fatter, because we're all sitting around. We're computer scientists after all. Let's take advantage of that fact. Let's take advantage of the fact and basically lower the sampling frequency at that point. Right? So what this graph, again, I'm not getting into the details. You will have the slides, so you're more than welcome to look at that in the papers. But what we say is if you compare this adaptive version versus sampling at 50 hertz or 100 hertz or 16. So if you always sampled at 5 hertz, you would save more energy. But then you would miss certain critical markers, like when you went up the stairs or you went down the escalator and so on. If you sample at 100 hertz all the time, you wouldn't miss anything, but you would waste a lot more energy. By doing this adaptive thing, you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. It's important for me to point out one of the fundamental assumptions. This is all about detecting moderately long-lasting activities. So I'm not trying to do gesture detection. Or, you know, you're sitting, you stand up, and you sit down. Because there's a hysteresis effect here. I'm looking for a certain duration. That's not what we are after. So this is not to be used for game-playing recognition. It's all about the fact if you sit down, unless you're crazy, you don't usually get up in the next one second. If you start walking, you kind of tend to walk for about 30 seconds, wherever you're going, right? Unless you're pacing up, even if you're pacing up and down in your room, you'll be doing that for more than 15 seconds, 20 seconds. So that's what it illustrates. So we built an application, we gave it out to people, and to skip all this, we illustrated the point for two users. The green line is when you have no activity recognition. The red line is activity recognition at 50 hertz. The blue line is our app. Now, this is not an orange for orange or apple for our apple comparison. These are three different days of the user, because we didn't want to take the same trace and play it back. 
So the, this is the natural usage of the phone. And in some cases, you see there's a sudden dip. Why? Because we found out that morning that guy decided to watch a lot of YouTube videos while he was on the train. So his battery drained out really fast anyway. But our point is, across users, on you know, this is a snapshot of two different days. What we find is we end up saving about 30% of energy through this whole process. So not tremendous amounts, but it's something that you know we're nothing to be ashamed of. So that's the first piece of the story. The next thing I wanted to talk about is this aqua. This part I will skip because this is all one phone. So this work was born out of some health care or wellness related applications I was doing in my previous job where I said you had body one sensors, they were collect the phone was the gateway, it was collecting the data from everybody. So we said typically you would have queries like this running on the phone. You wanted to alert somebody. You wanted to alert somebody if your heart rate was above 100, and I'm, I'm using very simple, descriptive, uh, non-representative terminology. If the acceleration was less than two, what did it mean? That meant you were not doing vigorous activity, you were just sitting down, and your heart rate was very elevated, and your temperature was, you know, okay, the, this is the ambient temperature outside. It's more than 80 degrees. So, you know, this is a condition where you might have a stress on your heart. So in that case, you would want to SMS or alert the caregiver, you know, let's find out what's going on. So, can we save energy by not having to take the data from all the sensors all the time? So, the idea is simple. If I want to say, let me just explain this, you know, without even looking at the slide. I want to find out if everybody in this room is sitting. That's my query, right? So the naive way, which is what people would do, is each of you are a sensory. I would tell you, just tell me if you're sitting or not. Report it to me. I will make a determination, are you sitting or not? You would waste everybody's energy. The smarter way would be, I would just go around asking each person in turn, are you sitting? Are you sitting? Etc. And the first person I hit who says, no, I'm not sitting, I'm standing, I'm done with the query. Because this was an all or nothing query, right? Everybody had to be sitting. So I would have saved, if I started off with you and I was lucky enough, I would have saved asking all the other 50 people in the room. So I would have saved the energy in, in that process, right? So I use a simple query here that, you know, if my average heart rate is over 100 over 5 seconds and my pulse oxygen level saturation is drop below 90, do something, alert something. So which sensor do I query first, the SpO2 or the HR? So the, the reality is different events are less likely and different sensors need different amounts of data. So without getting into the details of the table, there are some obvious strategies. So the first strategy is you evaluate the predicates with the lowest energy consumption. So if it turns out that there's a cheaper sensor, which is SPO2, first verify the predicate for that. This is what compilers do all the time. It's 101 for compiler optimization, right? Evaluate the predicate that's cheaper. And if that's, in this case, it's an AND query. So if that's true, then you get the sensor from the other one. The other one is select the predicate with the higher false probability, the more selective predicate. Because if it turns out to be false, you can abort the query. You're done, you don't need to. So it turns out that in this kind of setting, again, I'm not getting into the math, the right way seems like would be to do some combination of the two. You would have some balancing factor between selectivity and cost. And that's precisely what we're doing. Now, that was a very simple example. Now, the thing where we're going is we're running queries on all of you at the same time, continuously. And there are multiple queries. Some say, are you standing and are you near the door? Somebody says, are you on your phone? Plus, is the person next to you sitting down, etc. Right? So there is a lot of sensing, computation, communication costs to be traded off over here. So think of these as complex set of queries. How do you do the optimization? So that's what we had a couple of papers on. This is what, you know, basically it's sort of more complex optimization logic, of query optimization logic. And what I wanted to illustrate at the end of the day, when we ran these simulations with these health sensors and the phone, um, let's illustrate. We did Bluetooth and 802.11, but let's just pick any one. So we picked this one. This shows the energy <coughs> saved. So this is the naive way where everybody reports. This is the static way where I figure out your predicate selectivity first, and then I decide a sequence. This one I didn't have time to get into. This basically says that at each instant of my query evaluation, I change the order because some of the data may already be in my buffer. So the, the selectivity, the cost metric changes. So if you do that, you go from 2,500 to about you know, 800 joules. So you get about a factor of three reduction. But you see in the, oops, in the bytes transmitted, you get a much steeper reduction. 
But so we saved a lot in the data, but we didn't save that much in energy, which was really our key metric. Why is that? Because these interfaces, they're not linear. They have a startup cost, they have a shutdown cost. You know, the, the costs are amortized over the data. So, and you see the behavior depends, it's different for Bluetooth, and it's different for 8011. The point here is, uh, the high level takeaway is, do not just look at the bytes saved and assume you're gonna save energy. Because the way the interfaces work, you know, they have their startup thresholds for the thing to power on, transmit the data, and then power down. That can give you very different real life savings as opposed to just looking at the data transmission numbers. Okay? So with that in mind, let me get to the point of illustrating where I was going. Where are we going with this? This is our cloud query context service. So <coughs> what we say is, I want to sense a lot of things about all of you. But the reality is different queries sense different things about different people. And we are saying there's going to be a cloud service, some server. All the phones are connected there. All of the queries get dumped on the server. And this server is doing the query optimization, answering all your queries, but doing it in an intelligent manner so it reduces the total energy drainage across all the phones. So I just, um, you know, maybe it's a bad example here. So one of the queries, for example, could be, tell me when three students of 2012 taking ISM, which is a course, are co-located. So I can design my assignment, discuss my assignment. So the example here is the high-level query, you're not interested in one person. You're interested in a combination of context from multiple people. You want to know when certain things are satisfied. Right? So somebody else has a query says, let me know if one of these three persons, ABC, are back in the office not using the cell phone. I can design, discuss my assignment with them. So research question is, can we save energy by better coordinating the queries across a large number of phones? So to illustrate this process, there is this service, two different queries. They come from... They, the M is the, the, the membership set, so which phones are you interested in? So one says, I'm interested in your phones, another query says, I'm interested in those people's phones. And they can overlap, right? They can have intersections and overlap. And Q is the query. So in this process, this system will figure out, I'll take the data from two phones first, and with only the data from the two phones, I'll answer query one. And then it figures, oh, to answer query two, I need data from a third phone. And then I answer application two. So let's illustrate this and you'll see where the query optimization comes in. So this was from you know, something we were presenting to Changi Airport, you know, so little, little, little airport scenario. So suppose there's two queries in this case. One says, when, inform me when A is standing and is near the security gate. Two conditions, both are made. The other query is, inform me when one of A or B is standing. So typically, how are we getting this? I mean, in the knife case, you will use the accelerometer from A to see if he's standing, the Wi-Fi from A to see their location, and for B, you only need standing, so use the accelerometer sensor from A to B. And you will be sending this data all the time. So the first approach, which is the aqua approach I described, you would optimize them individually. You would look at A and say, I want to get location, Wi-Fi, and standing acceleration. Which one is cheaper, etc. Let me get that. So I might end up getting the location Wi-Fi first. In parallel for B, I might get that standing B first. It turns out that if you do that, again, very simple query optimization and laws of combinatorics, that if one of these is true, you will always need the other one. So the smart choice here is if you do them, optimize them jointly. In one case, you will have to do all three sensors. What I wanted to illustrate, just the thought process here. If I first find out if A is standing, let's say I use the accelerometer on A, I find out A is standing. Suppose that is true, then I will never need to know if B is standing or not because the OR condition. So what I'm illustrating here is you will either need this sensor or this sensor. You will never have a case to need both. So I'm already saving you know, one third of the sensor data just through the simple example. Now extrapolate this to real world scenarios and real world testing and you'll see that you can begin to save a fair amount of energy. And the initial lab experiments, this is by no means conclusive, suggest that when we do the individual optimization versus asking you all to send the data to me, you save about 48%. When you do the joint computation, we're saving another additional 27%. So collectively, if we can indeed save 70% and we still satisfy all these continuous queries, that would be a huge win for us. Because remember, we were about 40% higher than the base rate. So out of 140, if we are able to save about 70%, of the 40%, that's the additional overhead, 
then we are only 10% higher than the base. And that's acceptable. So we're back at a point where we can do continuous query estimation without you know, killing the battery of individual phones. And that's what we are after. Okay, time for me to switch. I'll talk about in your localization. It's going to be much briefer. Um, it's a much, much research topic. I'll just explain to you some of the things that we've been working on. So the first point I wanted to make, and I made this to some of you, I see a lot of the literature in indoor localization say, okay, we are this accurate because you know, we can get to within two meters, we can get to three meters, etc. So my claim is that in a practical system, it's not just accuracy that's the important metric. It's a combination of accuracy and the energy because we're doing it continuously. What is the energy cost to actually get this accuracy? And then there's the infrastructure cost or scalability. So there are these key trade-offs. And the second point I wanted to make, if you look at the vast majority of the papers, they'll say we did indoor localization, we tested it with some users using an Android device. Why do you use Android? Because you can do Wi-Fi scanning and fingerprinting. It's an open API. It allows you to do that. In Singapore, as in many other parts of Asia, 80% of the people still use iPhones, not Android. So in a practical system, we, we've actually built the localization system. We've deployed it, we found only you know, 10 people sign up for the service. The other 200 people said, oh, do you have an Android version? No. Why, uh, do you have an iPhone version? No. Why not? Because iPhone, the API is locked. It doesn't give you, report to you the signal strength when you do Wi-Fi scanning. So what do we do in this case? So the researcher approach is to say, okay, we published the paper with Android. The practical system building says, okay, we have to have a solution for iPhone because the mall operator basically told us, if you don't have a solution for iPhone, go away, don't talk to us. Because we're not interested. You guys, computer scientists, great, publish your papers. I don't want to hear from you. So we have used a combination of techniques, Wi-Fi, fingerprinting-based triangulation. All of these are well-known techniques. So movement-based continuous tracking, where we do step counting and the bitter be smoothing which is with the accelerometer and compass. And then I'll talk about the accelerometer and barometer. This is a new sensor. It's appeared in some phones. So here is our basic strategy. So it's a combination of three things. One, periodically, at a certain time, we do the Wi-Fi scan based on fingerprints. This could be either done on the phone for Android. For iPhone, we use the controller. So every Wi-Fi infrastructure has controllers that report to you the signal strength that the AP sees about the phone. One big difference, for those of you working in your localization, you find commercial systems. So in the Android, you do a scan and you get 15 APs. So actually, when we did it in our initial, uh, in our lab, we got 240 access points at one point. You know, many of them were virtual access points because it's the same AP with different SSIDs, right? We didn't realize that. So even if you filter out many, many points, so you can do very accurate, many multidimensional fingerprinting. But when you go to the Android, uh, the iPhone-based system, the controller will only report to you the signal strength of the AP to which you're associated. So you suddenly drop from 30 dimension to one dimension. So that reduces the accuracy of your system a lot. So we do this periodically. In the meanwhile, we're using the, acceler the accelerometer and the compass on the phone to do the inertial, you know, the inertial tracking, the dead reckoning, how much have you moved in what direction, right? Very standard technique. And then we run this bitter computation. For those of you who know, it's like computing the most probable path through a trellis because uh, I won't get into all the details. So some of the key practical challenges. So again, without going into all, as I said, I'll skip all the details, some of the techniques are well known. So the first thing we wanted to find out is, how accurate can we even detect indoor location if we did fingerprinting? And what this thing shows is two landmarks. This is SIS, our campus building. This is Plaza Singapore, our mall. This is the earth mover distance, which is a measure of the dis dis divergence between two distributions. These are distributions of the signal strength across different APs. So one thing you observe is, in landmark night, in SIS, the earth mover distances start moving up really fast. What does it mean? That means I'm standing here. The statistical histogram of my signal strength here is different from the signal strength three meters away. Right? Because the, the distributions are different. What that suggests is, if I fingerprint at that granularity, I can start localizing you at 3 meter accuracy. Why is that? Because our campus building, many nooks and crannies, many doors and obstacles. So you go around an obstacle, very different radio environment than when you're on the other side of the obstacle. Two meters away, you see very different radio environments. You go to Plaza Singapore, which is a mall, and if you know the malls in Asia, they have big hollow dome in the middle, 
you can see all the floors, and they have these two wide aisles along the side, and all the stores are along the side. When you do that, you begin to see that the distribution of the radio signal strengths, as measured not by on your phone. Remember, this is not you know custom made measurement devices with very high sensitivity. On your phone, you see that as up to 16 meters, you don't really see any statistically different distributions because it's all sort of line of sight open propagation. So immediately it suggests, the key takeaway is, you know, you can take your algorithm and somebody asks you how accurate is your algorithm, what is your error rate, you cannot give an answer. The answer is building specific. And that's very unfortunate because it suggests that there is no technique out there that you can immediately say, oh, I'm, I want two meter accuracy, I'll use that algorithm. It depends very much on the layout of your environment, the building, its obstacles, etc. That's point one. The second point I wanted to mention, this is the density of visitors. So first let's look at Plaza Singh and, and RSS. So what, what we show over here, you know, when we do a scan on Android, this is the RSSI range for different things in DBM uh, with a negative sign. You know, and this is the number of access points at that point with that signal strength. So what you see here is this is low density when very few people are around. When a lot of students with phones come, you can clearly see the system shift to the right in terms of people. So what is happening? There are a few APs, and at the end, there is not that much difference. So let me translate what this graph means. It means that there are some APs that you hear very weakly, very poor signal quality. Those APs, more people come in, they will still remain indistinguishable. Their AP, their quality is going to be poor. There are some APs that you hear very strong signals. Those APs suddenly become moderate signal APs. So their signal becomes weaker. Why is this important? This suggests that if I fingerprinted during a time when there was low density users, and I used this fingerprinting strategy for localization, I would get errors. Why is that? Because human beings, we all absorb in the 2.4 gigahertz, you know, so we block signals. Our phones cause interference. So there are all these obstacles. When density increases, the signal strengths tend to move to the left. So this illustrates what have we got so far. So right now, our results, I wanted to illustrate this. So at the 80 percentile accuracy, we get about 10 meters, maybe 8 meters, in SIS, which is a campus building. And we only get 15 meters in the mall. Now, this is not the reported results where you get 2 to 3 meter accuracy in many papers. Yes. Yes. So, what this suggests to us is that reality is because of the fluctuation densities, you know, the layout of the places, the, the true results are often a lot more pessimistic than what your initial calibration experiments in your lab will suggest to you. This is not too bad because this, the average size of a store in Plaza Singapore is about 8 meters, which means that we are getting your location plus minus one store, which is okay as a starting point, but, you know, there's still work to do. So after that, we have created you know, the analysis and we exposed it. This is the value add to the mall. They can get deep maps of where people reside, you know, how people transition. They can track individual users, etc. So in this connection, I wanted to explain my femtocell work because we have a femtocell test bed. So largely, the analytics and prediction, the people use RF measurements. You measure signal strength, RSCP, RSSI variations, you collect, and you predict where people do it. Now, because of our software, we have access to other contexts, such as the user's movement speed how many people there will. So our question is, can we use this to predict various things such as network coverage, and our bandwidth, etc. So this is a quick schematic of our layout across two floors. This is one floor. We have three femtocells, uh, 3G femtocells, HSPA. Um, let's give the high level results. So not, nothing is surprising, but it's just a quantification. So this, pick any one. So this shows the lines are for different days. It says the distance from Femto 1 when we hand it off to Femto 2 for three different speeds, walking very slowly, walking like this, and walking a little fast. And it turns out that the variation goes from about 10 meters to about 14, 15 meters. You might say, so just your movement speed affects where you hand off by about 4 to 5 meters. You might say, okay, 4 to 5 meters, not a big deal. But the whole radius of these Femto cells, remember these are small cells, is 8 to 10 meters. So basically, you're getting about a 50% divergence at the point where you hand off because you, you change your movement speed. The next thing is look at the throughput. This is for a TCP connection. You look at any, this, 
forget the red line, the blue line shows your throughput. Look at this axis. This is when you're moving slowly. The throughput we got. Remember, there's nobody else on the network, no interference. We got about 5 megabits or 4 megabits per second of throughput from the phone. When we started walking fast, it dropped to 600 kilobits per second, an eight-fold drop. So while the qualitative results are all expected, we all know this. As you move faster, you hand off at a longer distance, you get poor signal. See in the femto environment, when the cells are really small indoors, this, this difference is accentuated. So it's pretty dramatic differences. Finally, we see that the signal strengths themselves should show as much as a 10 to 15 dBm variation at a specific location on different days at different points. So that means even if we did fingerprint, this thing would vary on different days. So where we are going with this is we are trying to address this problem of real-time RF creation. The logic is simple. I have the phones in a crowdsourcing manner report from their current locations what signal strengths they are seeing. They report it to our server. From that, I'm going to try to create a prediction model for different parts of the building, real-time given the context and predict what the signal strength is going to be at the other points. So to do that, we use two parts. One, we cluster the data. I'm skipping over a lot of details. So the clustering, and I don't have the graph here, you will see, if you leave the door open, for example, the propagation effect inside and outside, almost identical. You close it, the outside is very different than the inside. So you'll see as our clustering algorithm automatically, continuously running, creates different clusters for the room, a different cluster outside. If you leave the door open, it'll put them all in the same cluster because they have the same propagation effects. So first we create the cluster, then we estimate the alpha and R. This is a log distance path loss model. We parameterize each cluster differently. So we predict the values for each cluster. And the end result, what we show, is that previously we had about 25 dBm of error. If you did only static measurements and you found the, this is the standard deviation. But now we are down to about a mean error of 3.3 dBm and uh, a percentile, the, the 95th to 5th percentile is 12 dBm. So it's not perfect by any means. What it suggests is there are opportunities here because you know, indoor environments are notoriously difficult. People move things around, they leave doors open, you know, they pull shutters down, the RF characteristic change. But if enough people, this is showing the number of folds used for training, and what it suggests is if from 50% of the points, if you get readings, I can predict with high accuracy the RF behavior of the other 50% of the points. So what this is suggesting, why is this useful? So the accuracy obviously degrades when we have less observations. So if it's nighttime and there are only 10 of you in this building, I'll predict the other locations much more inaccurately. But that's okay because fundamentally, when do we need high accuracy? When the network is congested, when there are a lot more users in this building. So when it's congested, I will get better results, I'll make better predictions, which is exactly what we want. When it's not congested, who cares? You know, I'll get it all wrong, but you have the network to yourself. So I'm going to sort of end over here by just pointing out for the group analytics, what are one of the things we're doing right now? We're doing this called work called queue detection. So imagine there's a Starbucks, suddenly a bunch of people queue up, and there are other people around. They're, you know, just sipping their lattes, hanging out, with, waiting with their friends at the movie theater. What we're trying to do is to use the accelerometer to figure your activity, such as standing, walking, swaying, the compass, uh, and the Wi-Fi to get your location, and which way are you changing your direction of movement all the time, which suggests that you might not be queuing. And all of this, we're building up a sequential logic to determine if you are queuing. Now, that's never going to be as accurate. So this, this is actually a real trace of a person queuing. Look at the accelerometer. What they do is every now and then, they take a few steps forward. Right? This is what you expect in queuing. It's a little different than walking. So again, some finer details, typically you use frame sizes of 5 seconds. To get the distinct behavior for queuing, you have to use smaller frame sizes because you kind of move and stop. You don't continue walking. So right now, for one person in real life, you got 90% accuracy. Now, this is, I have to say, also with the phone in the pocket. These were real people standing in queues. We have plenty of queues in Singapore because there are a lot of people there. So, but we get 90% accuracy with the phone in the pocket. Once you take the phone out, you toggle it around, the accuracy drops. So what are we trying to do? This is the accuracy for one year. But queuing is basically a collective activity. Can we figure out how many people are queuing in different groups? So we figure out how many queues there are. One queue or two queues. So to answer also the question that I think you raised, why do I care about the number of queues? So imagine there are shops which are right next to one another. So 
it's hard from the location to distinguish whether you're in this queue versus the other. So you do need to know there are actually two different queues for two different shops because you might want to give the incentive only for one shop. The other shop is not participating in the process. So then I want to find out the position in the queue. Why am I doing all this? Because Starbucks is the canonical example. What it wants to do is automatically detect when people queue up and says, okay, there are 25 people in the queue now. It's taking long to serve. So all the people beyond 20, give them a 5% discount on their phone. And tell them if you hang on, you get 5% off coffee. So this way they're incentivized to stay on. This is an example of a context-aware service. So I covered the group analytics very briefly, as I promised. The experimentation service, maybe the next time I'm here, we'll have something to talk about. So I will stop over here. Just wanted to acknowledge a lot of people, uh, including my colleague at SMU, several faculty members. As I mentioned, this is a collaboration with CMU, so my main collaborator is three session, and a bunch of PhD students and research engineers. So with that, uh, I'm done. Uh, uh, considering the scenario which you told initially about uh, uh, people sitting in a cafe but giving a discount for four people sitting. So you said you'll have a localization up to 10-15 meters. So is it uh, the same uh, uh, amount of localization you achieve it even if uh, the users have kept their phone inside the pocket or inside a bag or something? Okay, so actually I'll answer that in two parts. So right now, you know, this is a phase, it's a five-year project. So to detect whether they're sitting together in a cafe, the eight meter localization or 10 meters is totally useless. Yes. Because, you know, they might, have they might, be, might be sitting in different parts. So our end goal is to get to one meter localization. How? We don't even know right now. Maybe it's a combination of some infrastructure, some peer-to-peer -peer sensing might be involved. So that's an ongoing process. I just want to be very upfront about that. Now as to the question, so if you look at the RF algorithms, etc., they don't really matter that much if it's in your pocket, or it's in your bag, etc. Uh, if you take the phone out and put it on the table, can I detect you're sitting or standing? Absolutely not. Yeah. So I think the real challenge here is going to be, I didn't show this slide, I cannot get this right 100% of the time. It's just not going to be possible. So the question is, can I detect, you know, historically, let's say you always come in with a group of four friends, Three of them are sitting and your phone is in the same location. I'll make the assumption that, okay, all four of you are sitting together. So there is a statistical likelihood on the basis of which we'll do the interventions. But we'll never be 100% correct. Okay. So, so I've just got one more question. Sure. So when you're actually tracking a user using an accelerometer, so how often uh, does the user actually convey his location to, to the hotspot or to the access points? Doesn't it actually consume much of a battery or anything? Okay, so actually I skipped that great question. So what we have tried out right now is, remember I said there's the Viterbi algorithm that does the smoothing yeah. on the stuff. So we do the fingerprint count based computation of location every three seconds or six seconds or 12 seconds. We try these three things. The reason we try these three is that roughly if you measure your gait in one second when you're walking, you move about 1.2 meters on average. So every three seconds you'll be moving about four meters. Okay, so as it turns out, that's why I said those metrics are important, that while Viterbi based location with the accelerometer gives you sort of the dead reckoning all the time, it consumes way more energy. Yeah. If you just do the Wi-Fi scanning and reporting, it actually doesn't consume as much energy if you do it every six seconds. But that's not the whole story. That's why, you know, and again, we're not the only group doing this. So there are well-known approaches that say that, you know, periodically sample the accelerometer. So if you find you're sitting down, don't even do the Wi-Fi scanning. You know, you know, go into this idle state. So that goes back to the A3R type logic. If you know the activity, you adjust the sampling and the feature reporting frequencies, and you try to be conservative. So eventually, we will, you know, our goal is to reduce the energy consumption. And frankly, at this point, our evidence suggests that all of that Viterbi based fine grain dead reckoning is not worth it when you consider the energy cost. So better to ditch the accelerometer, ditch the compass, and just stick with the Wi-Fi fingerprinting for now. A little less accuracy, but it lasts much longer. Uh, so you said you had about like 30,000 people on the front row. Are you planning on getting more, or? I don't have, I mean, we started, I mean, for those of you from Phone Lab, we started like a month ahead of you guys, that's all. So 
So right now we have about 50 active users in the program. Okay. Well, you're planning on getting we'll get to 30,000. We're using the support from our mall partners and centers and so on. There'll be incentives to sign them up. It's not just phones, they get rebates and vouchers from the mall. You know, they get special discounts and freebies, etc. That's how we sign people up. What, like, when for the coffee shop example, what are the chances of like all four people having that uh, app, I guess, on their phone and active and running for them to actually get that query to go through? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Again, I, beautiful question. I don't know the full answer, but I'll give you parts of the answer. So, deliberately, we have 5,000 people who are our students. Now, students, as you know, you know, it's birds of a feather flock together. So the student body is sort of hyper-sampled. So if the students go out for coffee, there's a very good chance the four buddies going out for coffee from the cohort, they all have the same app running. Now for the members of the general public, what we're trying to do is to incentivize people to say, when you sign up, try to get your buddies and your family members to sign up. They get additional discounts. So we're trying to leverage on a little bit of a weak network effect. So if you sign up, Chances are people you interact with also sign up. How successful it's going to be, I really don't know at this point because we're nowhere close to that yet. So besides the Spunkle cell and the APs, do you uh, want to deploy some other sensor infrastructures to move some energy consumption from those mobile users to those fixed devices? Uh, it's certainly possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Right now, that's not the plan. Mm -hmm. So in the SMU campus, it's possible. So I mean, so there is an ongoing piece of work which I don't allude to here. So we already have basic things like motion sensors and stuff. In the, so you can already think of combining these to get some combined sensor fusion. Mm -hmm. The challenge is if you think of motion sensors, they give you only aggregate information. They say somebody passed through, doesn't say who passed through, etc. right? And in large public spaces, as opposed to like home, smart home type settings, it, it quickly becomes a problem with this data doesn't become really useful because, you know, dozens of people are passing through. It's hard to disambiguate who actually passed through, which would help in the location. There is some, some kind of uh, RFID based indoor organization. Of that, course. So that uh, you can use their identification through the phone that you know these people uh, passing through, and I know that uh, this person is uh, around with this uh, sensor, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not ruling anything out right now for, I mean, look at the environments. One is the malls. Mm -hmm. The malls are very loath to put any additional infrastructure out there mm -hmm. for many reasons. One of them is actually cosmetic. They don't want any new equipment sticking out anywhere, etc. And uh, it gets to, this is a philosophical answer. So can we shift, I mean, why, what do we want? To shift the energy burden, of course, that's good. Mm -hmm. If we want more accuracy for location. Yeah. It's not clear to me, after all this work, that there is really a market there is a demand for finer location. So you've had these things, you know, RFID tag store shelves. You walk right next to it, it'll tell you, oh, you need conflicts, it's right over there. Right? I mean, this has been done for like 10 years now. Have these really been deployed? No. Because, you know, you go pretty much where your spouse tells you to go and you pick up your conflicts. Right? You don't need an RFID. So part of it is, you know, it's the philosophy that, you know, because we're working with commercial players, they tell us, oh, that's great technology, we don't need it. In our campus, which is more of an experimental setup, sure, we might go with RFID, we might go with other sensors. Um, you know, UWB gives even better accuracy, right, if you have a UWB dongle in your phone. But how many phones have UWB dongles? Zero, right now. So, I, right now our philosophy is not to try to augment the infrastructure at all. Will it change over five years? There's a very good chance it might. And that's part of the learning process, when we figure out what works and doesn't. Thank you. Okay, we put the magic number of three questions, so. Yes. <laughs> well, let's thank the speaker again. And that is the action packed, kind of like a, you know, high speed movie. It's very exciting. So, thank you very much. Well, I'm the uh, action hero sure. of that movie. So. Thank you very much again. Thank you. All. Yeah, yeah. Are we going now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>